In this lecture, I'm going to talk about ChIP-seq data preprocessing. But first of all, I want to thank Bori Mifsud for sharing a presentation with me. Analysis of ChIP-seq data. As for all high throughput sequencing data, first we will start by having a proper experimental design with controls and replicates. Then, after getting the sequencing data back from the sequencing facility, we will perform a quality check and some read preprocessing. The quality check will ensure that the quality of every sample or library was adequate. Then the reads will be filtered before being aligned to the genome of reference. Afterwards, quality check measures and assessment will be performed to ensure that all the data is as it should be. This will be subsequently followed by identifying regions which have a significant enrichment over noise, and this is done by identifying so-called peaks using tools called peak colors. Once one has identified peaks, one can perform various types of downstream analysis. If a study is the comparison of two different treatment, one could aim for doing a differential binding analysis. There are two types of such analysis. One could just be based on occupancy. So is there a peak in a given position? Yes or no. So here the question would be, are there regions that are bound or unbound differently based on the treatment? As RNA-seq, ChIP-seq is also dynamic, meaning that Another type of differential binding analysis is so-called affinity-based analysis, where one would look at the amount of reads, in other words, the height of the peak, comparatively between two treatments. Is it locus in one treatment more enriched than another locus? Different type of analysis could be, for example, validation and downstream analysis, where one would like to know what is the motive of a transcription factor of interest. One could also want to figure out and annotate all the genes that are related to a given transcription factor. And one could also think at integrating binding information with other type of high throughput sequencing data such as expression data. If I have a binding event at the transcription factors binding site, does that result in an increased expression data? Looking more specifically on the data preprocessing step, when one does a chromatin immunoprecipitation, what we end up selecting is the DNA that is protected by a protein or a nucleosome of interest. Because we fragment the DNA, only the DNA close to that protein is going to be detected, and hence this is only the DNA that is going to be sequenced. A very interesting property of ChIP-seq is that there will be an enrichment at the 5' end, so on the left side of the protein for reads which are on the positive strand whereas on the right side of the protein, there will be an enrichment for reads coming from the negative strand. This becomes clearly visible at the alignment step, where we have an enrichment before the protein for the positive strand and after the protein for the negative strand. This property is actually being used for peak finding, and peak finding may take two approaches. One would be to generate the density of the reads before and after the binding event, so the reads on the plus and on the minus strand, and the distance between the, these two peaks from the plus and the minus strand, when you have it, is going to be the position of the binding side of the nucleosome or protein. Another approach used by peak finding, peak colors, is to shift the sequence from the left and the side by half the size of the distance between the peak. 
also identifying them the highest peak where the protein binding set will be. Finally, a last solution is to extend the fragments, the sequence trait, by the expected sequence length of the fragment, creating a much broader peak, which mode will also be at the expected binding site. This transformation can also be used for quality control. In a typical ChIP-seq experiment, you would expect an enrichment of reads, very few of which would have the exact same location. If you have a PCR artifact, you will end up seeing towers or skyscrapers of reads mapping exactly at the same position. These are artifacts that are easily uh, observable and should be taken away from the data as these are not of biological origin. Looking at these peaks, one can also decide whether the chip, the chromatin precipitation, was successful or not. In a properly enriched chip, you would see large peaks and you would have an easy time figuring out the shift between the positive and the negative uh, peaks. In a poorly enriched chip, you wouldn't be able to perform the same. Here, one of the most likely cause for getting a poorly enriched chip is the use of an antibody that isn't specific enough. This is the most important step in a chip -seek experiment with selection, the choice of the antibody to use and making sure in the lab that it is specific and will provide enough material before even doing any sequencing. Once one has enough data, one can then look and determine for all the peaks what is this value of k, so what is the shift. And the shift should actually represent the length of the fragment, so the distance between the plus and the minus trend, the distance of the sequencing event. And this would be, in that example, the peak that we expect here by a normal distribution around here centered around 150 base pair. But one might also see phantom peaks, and these phantom peaks are actually created by sequences that small reads that came from fragments that were not born by the protein of interest. So this is noise, and usually this noise is the size of your sequence read. So how can we take this to measure and devise whether we had a proper enrichment. If we look here, we have a successful experiment where clearly the peak at the fragment length, the expected peak, is much higher than the peak observed at the read length. Meaning that the distance between here the fragment length and the read length between the two is positive and very high. In that panel in the middle, we have a more marginal experiment where there is a cheap peak, but the phantom peak is much higher. Finally, in the last panel, we clearly have a failed experiment where we hardly see any peak, but we have also here clearly a high phantom peak. Once we have validated the quality of the experiment, then the next thing we do is we're going to use a peak calling software to identify the region of interest. The basic idea of peak finding is simply to take a region and count the number of reads in that window and determine whether this number is above the background noise. If so, the region is then defined as bound. Clearly in, in that example where we look at three different histone methylation marks, you can see high peaks, which are clearly higher than the noise around them. Here we have three different marks, one being an activator, or a mark that marks usually promoters, H3 for histone free, K4 for uh, lysine 4 methylation free. So K4 and 3 marks promoter regions, as can be seen here. 
whereas an oral mark such as H3K27ME3, which is a repressive mark, marked the gene body of genes that are not expressed. Finally, H3K36ME3 being a positive mark, marked the gene bodies also of genes that are expressed. From that experiment, we can probably assume that the gene 61 is repressed wherever the gene 64 is being expressed. More details about peak finding and some common peak colors. There are a large number of peak colors. Um, these three are quite often used in the literature. One of them is MAX2, the other one is called USIC, and the last one is called CSORS. So CSR, but pronounced like CSORS. MAX2 calculates the peak shift by taking the thousand best peaks. Event shifts the reads on the free prime and, and use that to identify potentially bound regions. It calculates an arrangement between um, and the significance using a Poisson distribution with a locally estimated parameter lambda. USIC has a different approach. It also calculates the peak shift, but on all, the, on all data, it then shifts the read, which are on the free prime end, and then define windows. And this window scanning, it uses to calculate enrichment per window and the significance using a negative binomial distribution. Once you identify regions, it might join regions that are next to each other, provided they are within a given gap distance. Finally, it provides a multiple correction at um, enrichment fault discovery rate. Scissors, the last of the three I want to talk about, has a different way of finding peaks. It first estimates the fragment length, so the mean distance between the forward and the reverse reads, and this is the so called parameter W. Then it creates windows of size W half of W and it uses that to look at the profile of expression throughout all the genome. And it defines potential peaks whenever the transition between the net tag count changes from being positive to becoming negative or vice versa. Having identified this region, is going to calculate the enrichment and the significance using a Poisson distribution. This is all about the preprocessing of chipset data.